So 364 days ago, many of you were at All Saints on Central electing your new bishop. I was in my living room with a friend, nervously alternating between pretty light, distracted conversation and a... Hello? There you go. So we were alternating between distracted conversation and obsessively updating my Twitter and Facebook feeds to find, on, find out what was going on in Arizona. And then my phone rang with an Arizona number. And I answered it with shaking hands. And I heard Bishop Smith say the following words, Jennifer, this is Kirk Smith. And this is the phone call that's going to change your life. And that phone call, that call from you from this diocese, and the faith you have put in me as your bishop most certainly has changed my life. And I am so grateful for the ways in which it has done so. And I am also so grateful for all the people who have guided you and me through this transition. First the search committee, then the transition committee, all of you who contributed in so many ways to making that consecration such a holy and joyful event, not just for me and, and not even just for us, for the diocese, but, but for the wider church. People were excited about Arizona's consecration all over the U.S. And once I arrived at the staff at Dio, all the staff at Dio House, our standing committee, the staff at the cathedral, and each one of your congregations who has welcomed me to a visitation, everyone has continued to shape me and help teach me what it is to inhabit this role of bishop. Thank you so much. Now, the title of this congregation, this con convention, and the title of Canon Scott Gunn's book, Walk in Love, comes from, as you've heard several times now, that familiar offertory sentence, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Now, some of you, every time you've heard it at this convention, might sort of find yourselves reflexively reaching for your wallets upon hearing that sentence, because you've been conditioned to hear that verse and think that what it means is I have to give money. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to think. But hear it again outside the context of Eucharist and definitely away from reaching for your wallet. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. And to me, that verse gives us an image of walking, but it's also, it's an image of walking with a group. You know, we're walking with Christ, but, but we're walking with other people too, and, and we're going somewhere. We're not standing still. We are walking with Jesus. And Paul points out in this verse that our ability to love one another begins with Christ's love for us. Let me say that again. Our ability to love one another begins with Christ's love for us. Christ loved us first. And the only way that we can walk lovingly with each other is because we are the beloved of God. And so is the person walking beside us. And the way that Jesus loves and the love that we are called to reflect back and to emulate is a love that is outward facing. It's an offering and it's costly. It's a sacrifice. So how are you walking in love as an offering and a sacrifice to God? To whom are you offering yourself as a minister, as a blessing, as a neighbor? And what part of yourself, your life, and your faith are you willing to sacrifice in service of drawing closer to the beloved creator. How are we as a diocese and as congregations walking in love like this? 
I feel like you probably heard some stories about that yesterday at your tables. To whom are we offering ourselves? And where are we called to sacrifice? Well, in the last 10 months, I have been to 40 of our 64 congregations. Obviously not all on Sunday mornings, but I'm doing my best to get to know our congregations and our diocese. And you are amazing. Every congregation, every community I visit, even the ones that I'm visiting because of some sort of conflict or because something is wrong, you know, they contain joy and love and faith. You are praying and worshiping and learning and making music and loving your neighbors and teaching children and being taught by children. And at least when the bishop visits, you are always eating. <laughs> the food in this diocese is good. <laughs> and the we that is this diocese is far more diverse than every sing any single parish. Again, something I hope you got a sense of yesterday. We are infants up to about 109 years old. We are male, female, and non-binary. We are African-American, Anglo, Latino, African, Asian, Native American, and immigrants from all over the world. We are citizens, legal immigrants, and undocumented people. We worship in at least English, Spanish, and Dinka every week. We have praise bands, organs, choirs, mariachis, and bagpipes. We are straight and every letter of LGBTQIA. We are right one, right two, enriching our worship, and some other liturgical forms that we'll talk about another time. We are Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and non-voters. We are Cradle Episcopalians and people who have joined the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement from every other denomination and from no faith tradition at all. Hallelujah. And <laughs> And all of us are walking in love together, which I know is a struggle sometimes. But remember, it is only because Christ first loved us that we can love one another. And it is the love of Christ that gives us the power to love one another. Rachel Held Evans, a young Christian leader and writer who tragically died this past year, wrote in her book, Searching for Sunday, Imagine if every church became a place where everyone is safe, but no one is comfortable. That's the vision I would like to see in our congregations in this diocese. Because there is no single follower of Jesus who should feel self-satisfied and comfortable sitting in a pew listening to the gospel. Because the gospel is radical and challenging but we should be safe. We should be able to trust those around us to, to give us the space of grace to learn, to draw closer to Jesus, to make mistakes and repent and seek forgiveness, and to always, always look upon every human being with dignity and see the face of Jesus reflected in their eyes. And we need to be conscious that it is the most vulnerable that we are particularly called to keep safe. I remember a few years ago hearing Archbishop Justin Welby preach that for some period of time in the 19th century, the British East India Company did not permit their clergy to teach the Indians in their congregation the Magnificat. Imagine 19th century Anglican worship, evening prayer, without the Magnificat. But they were afraid that if masses of poor people actually prayed Mary's prayer, that he hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. If they prayed that, they might start to believe it. And if they believed it, 
if they believed that the meek would be exalted and the hungry would be filled. And even worse, if they believed that the mighty would be cast down and the rich would be sent away empty, well, that would be a threat to the company. So they withheld the gospel from the people. We cannot censor the gospel to protect our institutions or to make ourselves more comfortable. With full humility and with awareness of our own human frailty and limitations, we are called to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, even when it makes us uncomfortable. Reaching out our hands in love to all those who will worship and pray and work for the reign of God. We are part of building the beloved community of God, which requires our faithful prayer and study and worship and action. And we are already on this path. Jesus has been walking with us for our whole lives. But you do have new leadership. <laughs> and so there are some new ways that we are going to do this together in the coming year and beyond. Here are a few of the ways that we are going to courageously preach the gospel and lovingly hold together this diverse and wonderful diocese in the next year. So a natural part of living in community is experiencing conflict. You heard that from St. James today. And developing skills in seeking and facilitating reconciliation is crucial both for lay and ordained leaders in the church in our vocation to carry on Christ's work of reconciliation in the world. And the Lombard Mennonite Peace Center has been a leader in reconciliation work since the late 1980s. And so a year from now, in November of 2020, Trinity Cathedral and the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona will be hosting the Lombard Mennonite Peace Center to lead their Mediation Skills Training Institute for church leaders. I encourage our clergy to set aside a week of their continuing education time to register for the training. And I encourage as many lay leaders as possible to make that commitment too. I envision a diocese with a common language around reconciliation. And I imagine what a gift to our congregations and communities it would be to have people trained in skills of mediation in parishes all around the diocese, ready to utilize those skills, both in their local parish and on behalf of the wider church and on behalf of the wider world, which is so desperately in need of examples of reconciling love. It is important to be reconcilers, but part of what gives us the ability to mediate our differences is the accountability we find in our life together. And one way in which we find that accountability is through our canons. We are called to build safe churches, and clergy misconduct can demolish that safety. I might add that the misconduct of lay people can also destroy the safety of our churches, but that is not governed as thoroughly by canon law. One of my first actions as your bishop was to send out a pastoral letter describing new intake procedures for Title IV, the Episcopal Church's means for addressing clergy misconduct. We now have available on our website a single email and a dedicated phone number to streamline reporting for those who wish to report in that way. It's Title IV, Title IV, at azdiocese.org. The phone number is on the website. Rather than having a single intake officer in the person of the canon to the ordinary, we now have five intake officers spread geographically through the diocese and who are diverse in their language skills, gender, sexuality, and are both lay and ordained. They are Canon Debbie Royals, the Reverend Ann Johnson, Canon Martir Vasquez, and Mr. Clyde Coons who join Canon Anita Braden in that important ministry, a church where everyone is safe. That's what we want to build. Healthy clergy make for healthy churches, and I desire all of our clergy to be active in their prayer and study and fellowship with one another so that we may not be siloed in each of our separate congregations. Arizona's big, and it can be a lonely place. 
And clergy collegiality was clearly identified as a growth area when I arrived here for the walkabouts and upon arrival as your bishop. So as one way of addressing this, we are going to embark upon a two-year trial period of a deanery structure beginning in November of 2019. Deanery meetings will take place five times per year and replace the current clericus gatherings. And I will be giving a topic or a Bible study for each meeting in the first year. Those topics in the first year will include reflections on our ordination vows and what it means to be a priest or a deacon, a Bible study of First Peter in preparation for my travel to the Lambeth Conference next summer, which takes First Peter as its theme, and I want to take your reflections and your perspectives with me, and theological conversation about our role as stewards of creation. There are six deaneries, three in the Phoenix area, one in Tucson, one in the north of our diocese, and one Zoom deanery comprised of our rural churches, sort of in a ring around the diocese, whose gatherings will be via webcam, since those congregations have so much in common and should be able to gather together for support and sharing of ideas. I'll attend one meeting per year in each deanery, and at the end of the two-year trial, we will evaluate and see whether we should continue, change, or expand the deaneries into regional convocations that will gather and support not just clergy, but congregational ministry at many levels. Another change for clergy involves those at retirement age. This is a change that was obviously so beloved by one person they sent us flowers in the office. Prior to now, clergy had previously been expected to attend all diocesan gatherings in order to remain licensed or active. I want to maintain those expectations for clergy who are under 72 and clergy who are over 72 years old who are compensated for at least quarter time work because those clergy are teaching and preaching and in many cases leading our congregations and must be up to date with goings on in the wider church. But clergy who are over 72 and who are not stipendiary may opt out of the burden of attending diocesan events while still being active in their local parishes. I know for myself, when I imagine my retirement, I want to be able to serve at the altar and preach for as long as possible. And that is a more essential part of our identity and vows as clergy than attending meetings. <laughs> We are blessed by the presence and ministry of so many retired clergy in our diocese. And finally, I want to highlight and explain two staffing changes reflected in the 2020 Statement of Financial Mission. My experience in walking with Jesus is that sometimes God puts something in front of you. It can be a mission, a relationship, a burden, something. You're just walking on the road and there it is. And you can either walk away from it or you can pick it up. And the faithful response is usually to take it up. In Arizona, our border is that something that God has put in front of us. We could turn away from it and ignore it, but we hear the commandment of God in Deuteronomy, you shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. We hear that commandment echoed through all of scripture, and we look at the child, the mother, the person seeking safety from violence and famine, and we see the face of Jesus. We have already taken up this ministry. Bishop Smith wrote a wonderful book called Bishops on the Border a few years ago, and currently over 20 of our congregations are doing some kind of ministry involving migration, immigration, and border issues. But no one is coordinating those ministries, connecting volunteers and needs, or helping us adapt as policies and procedures change, and they are changing so frequently. Cruzando Fronteras, our flagship ministry as a diocese, needs administrative help and support to step forward into financial and structural sustainability. And our diocese receives frequent requests from outside Arizona, from visitors who want to help at the border, but we don't always have the structures and the ability to allow them to do so. So we're not serving our neighbors and welcoming the strangers as effectively as we might. Consequently, the 2020 Statement of Financial Mission includes a new 
full-time Missioner for Border Ministries position that will meet those needs. And we've received a grant from Episcopal Relief and Development to fund the position beginning on November 1st, 2019, pending the adoption of the 2020 budget today. The missioner will be out in your congregations on Sundays, preaching and teaching and connecting you to the wider church. They will be helping Crisando Fronteras develop the structures for financial and administrative stewardship, connecting congregations to ecumenical and civic partners for ministry with migrants, and developing a border pilgrimage for people outside Arizona and for some of us inside Arizona to come and see for ourselves our southern border and return home carrying the stories of those who are on this journey. The second position created for 2020, pending the passage of the budget, is a canon for creation care. We love our land in Arizona. I don't know anyone who lives in Arizona who is immune to the beautiful and biblical landscape of desert, mountain, canyon, and forest. And because of our particular landscape, we are more attuned than many to how fragile our ecosystems are. Drought can imperil species and habitats, and then a single rainstorm brings abundant life to the desert. As inhabitants of this land, we feel the pressure of increasing fires and floods and our concerns about water and energy and pollution and climate change. Both as Arizonans and as Christians, we know that we must learn to live more lightly on the land in order to live up to our role as stewards of creation. This position arose because a clergy person who was an environmental advocate in their pre-ordination life approached me with the possibility of structuring a mobile position helping congregations. Like the Missioner for Border Ministries, this person will also be out in your congregations on Sundays, ministering through preaching and teaching, providing resources to your congregation to live more lightly on the earth, encouraging parish action and projects, and connecting our diocese to organizations like Interfaith Power and Light and the wider Episcopal Church's resources for grants, theological materials, and inspiration. These two positions are part of something that I realized when I arrived, which was that there were only two ordained people on the staff of the diocese who could actually be out in congregations on Sunday mornings. We have our canons for Hispanic ministries, our canon for Native American ministries, our canon for stewardship, but they're in their own churches on Sunday mornings. And so it's only the canon to the ordinary and the bishop who can actually be with you on Sunday. I want two more positions, two more people who are able to be with you so that you and your congregation can feel more connected to the whole. And they will also be an important part of planning for our next diocesan convention. The Episcopal Church has identified three pillars of building the beloved community, care of creation, evangelism, and racial reconciliation. And we are going to take each one of those as organizing topics for our next three diocesan conventions. And we're going to do some collective work on those topics, both before and after the conventions, in study, prayer, and action, so that we can dive more deeply into how we as Christians care for our earth, proclaim the gospel, and heal the sin of racial injustice. So it gives me great pleasure to announce today that the 60th convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona on the topic of care of creation will be held on October 16th through 17th, 2020 at the El Conquistador Hilton in Tucson. <laughs> There's murmuring. <laughs> I am accustomed to having convention rotate locations to make it more convenient for one group of people one year and more convenient for a different group of people the next year. So we are gonna test out what it will be like to meet in Tucson next year. I can tell where all the Tucson churches are sitting. The 61st Convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona will be back in Phoenix on October 15th and 16th, 2021, 
focusing on evangelism. And our keynote speaker and leader of that convention will be our evangelist in chief, presiding bishop Michael Curry. Our 2022 convention will be in a location to be determined later and will take up racial reconciliation as our focus. It is quite a walk we're on, a walk in love, a walk in joy, a walk in friendship. You are a blessing to me and I feel so supported by your prayers and by the warmth and hope when we gather. I'm excited about the future of this diocese and about the future of the church as a whole because I feel like in my ministry, I catch a glimpse of the reign of God every day. I'd like to close with one of my favorite prayers from morning prayer, which encapsulates much of what I believe about walking in love with Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name, amen.